All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Dominika. I will be talking about uh, acoustic detection range in forest birds. Uh, I have the great pleasure uh, of being invited here. So just a quick intro. I am a fledgling. I have just finished my PhD studies and I am waiting for my doctoral thesis defense. Um, basically, all of my works, they came out this year, so I'm really fresh. Uh, and today I will be talking about one of these works, so detection ranges of forest bird vocalizations. Um, to begin with, we have to start with what PAM is. So passive acoustic monitoring is a great and very convenient method of studying animals, in this case birds, uh, through sounds. So with PAM, we can go to the field, deploy our recorders and leave them there. Uh, for right now, basically unlimited amount of time because we have uh, recorders that are uh, powered with solar energy. Uh, so if you think uh, of how technology uh, is developed now, we really have endless possibilities uh, of uh, studying species uh, through this method. So comparing PAM to field visits, we can say that it's very efficient and almost sustainable if you, if you think of it as uh, in the in the long term and how uh, much data we can gather. We have to begin with detectability. So humans are not super good at estimating detection distances or estimating the distances that birds are singing at. So we can do it to some, mm, to some level. So about 50 to 70 meters, we are pretty good at estimating the distance, but um, the distances uh, that are further away are very difficult for us to precisely estimate. And kind of the same things uh, happen with PAM. So when we are recording um, soundscapes, we don't really know from how far we are getting all those birds that are singing. So this space is called the detection range or detection radius. This is the space that your recorder is hovering uh, when it's recording. And if we think of it from the very other side, so from the animal side, you can see that sometimes we have, for example, Robin that can be recorded from 150 meters. And then we have the Tony Owl that can be recorded from, let's say 300 meters. And both of these species are recorded on the same device. So keep in mind that detection range is not something that is uh, constant. Uh, it changes uh, with the uh, source of the sound. And that area that is covered by those species is called the active space. So what influences detectability? Well, it's basically everything. So we have needles, we have leaves in the forest, but also the temperature, humidity, wind, um, terrain structure, uh, the, the grid that the trees are in, um, their placement, they can be closer to one another or further away. It all affects detectability. And because of this variability, PAM studies are pretty much incomparable. We cannot compare them directly because we know that uh, detection ranges are very different uh, for each site and they even differ within the same site. How to account for that variability? Is there any kind of standard standardization that we can, um, that we have or we can apply uh, to do it? Well, not really. The only recommendations are to measure your detection range. So it has been done uh, in, in some work. So we have those recommendations just to calibrate your equipment to see what your setup really is uh, in the field. And actually uh, calibration requires more time in the field and hence more money because we have to devote our time for additional visits to the field and perform those measurements of the detection ranges. And a nice example of that is the study uh, done by Peroni et al. Uh, from previous year. So what they have done is they were studying the pygmy owl in Finland and they were doing the abundance and density um, and density measurements with PAM. 
So uh, what they have done is um, they did their measurements of detection range, but it was very, very smooth. And it's a nice example that you can do it and not devote a whole uh, paper to it. So it was just the additional information that, yes, we are detecting uh, our species from, from that distance. And this is uh, what we used for our uh, measurements of uh, abundance and density. So uh, this is our approach. We wanted to uh, measure what are the maximum distances from which we can record birds. So to do that, we performed transmission or propagation experiment. And please do try this at home because this is basically the recipe to measure your own detection ranges. What we have done is we developed two straight line transects uh, in two types of forests in Poland, so Central Europe. Uh, the first one was coniferous forest, uh, which consisted mainly of pine trees. Uh, and the second one was deciduous forest, um, which, uh, which mainly had uh, beech trees. And the transect type, uh, the transect length was uh, 500 meters. So please, if you are using uh, different units, you can find them on the uh, right side of the slide uh, below the, the figure. Um, and throughout that long transect, we've placed 10 wildlife acoustic song meter four recorders, and they were placed at 50 meter intervals. So you have to divide that number by 10. Um, and at the beginning of the transect, at the point of zero, we've placed the speaker uh, at the height of three, six and nine meters. And the height was random, so it wasn't always in this order. In this order, uh, so that was uh, done because we wanted to see how different song post um, affects detection probability. And we were playing bird vocalizations once a month from April to June, and that was done during one season in 2021. Here we are uh, deploying the recorders, so. Uh, I am here up on the ladder holding the SM4. Here is my supervisor, Paweł Szymański, that is also the co-author of this work. And you can see that we are deploying the equipment quite high on the tree, and that is for two reasons. So we thought that when you are doing PAM, you would usually put your recorders, recorders uh, higher. And the reason for that is you want to be closer to the birds you are studying, and usually most birds sing from um, higher positions. And the other one is that they wouldn't be uh, stolen. What we played is the playback of 31 bird species. So each species was played for one minute. And during that one minute, we, uh, we had at least two types of vocalizations. Uh, species, was, species were uh, divided into groups, into size-related groups. Um, so we had large species pigeons and the common cuckoo, medium group with uh, thrushes and woodpeckers, and small group with all sorts of uh, songbirds. The playback was, uh, was done one hour after sunrise to avoid significant masking from the dawn chorus. And this is very tricky. We tried to play, uh, to play those vocalizations with their natural loudness, but the literature on this topic is super scarce, so we had to do our own measurements um, if the literature was not there. So it is very tough if you don't have 10 individuals to measure and preferably in an equate chamber, uh, but it's not something that is happening in the forest. So we always have those external factors that are affecting uh, amplitude. And it also varies between individuals. We have um, birds that are bigger and maybe they sing uh, louder. And we have species that, species, individuals uh, that sing uh, a little bit quieter. This is what we played, uh, the example of the common chiff chaff. So you can see three artificial sounds at the beginning and at the end of the recording that was to mark the recording uh, in the original um, recordings that, that we have um, from the field. 
And you can see those two types of vocalizations. And this is what we got. So basically, this is just the example from 100 meters. But you can clearly see those artificial sounds. And that is why they, they were here for. And you can also see that clear playback structure uh, of our played species. But you can also see significant masking from other birds that were inhabiting the forest. So it happened. And this is very important to know that during the analysis, uh, I had the knowledge uh, on what species I was investigating because we we wanted to have those maximum distances and without that and with this significant masking uh, it wouldn't be possible because if you imagine it's just 100 meters but if you think of uh, the further distances uh, away from from the speaker um, it, it was just too difficult without that um, initial knowledge what was what should be there in this recording so jumping to the data processing, the analysis involved uh, visual analysis of the spectrograms and listening to the recordings. So we had 5,500 one minute samples and we tried to mitigate that effect of me knowing the, the species with blind analysis. So for I prepared um, coded samples for other co-authors. Uh, it was about 300 samples. So they were uh, annotating all the species that they could see or hear uh, on, on those recordings. And we had pretty high unanimity on this. So this is what we did. And here is a quick glance at the models. So we wanted to test all those general effects that would affect some propagation in our case. So we had all those kinds of variables that were linked to the transect, so distance, transect type, height, or month. But we also had uh, features linked to species uh, or weather. So here we are in this investigating what influenced whether the species was detected or not. And here I am showing only the significant results, uh, because otherwise the table would be way too, too large. So you can see that. Um, the detection number decreased with distance, but more detections were stated for larger species that were also louder and at higher temperatures. Here is the model. It looks very similar to the previous one, where we investigate what factors influence the maximum distance that we got for each species. And here, the most significant effect was uh, for loud species. So louder species um, obtained longer distances. Here you can see probability of detection for two types of transects. So coniferous forest had slightly higher detection probability than deciduous one. Uh, but this difference, it's not super big. Um, so it's just to show you how it was in our case. But if we divide it into species, um, the colors here are the same. So red is coniferous, green is uh, deciduous, and blue is for both transects. So uh, you can see that um, detectability, the probability of detection, depended very much on the species. So if we take, for example, the common cuckoo and 75% detectability, we can see that it was still highly detectable at even 450 meters. But on the contrary, if we take, for example, great spotted woodpecker and the same 75% probability of detection, you can see that it was um, dropping above 100 meters. Here is the figure for all those species together. So here is the probability of detection for the common cuckoo. Here are two pigeons. So those species that were detected further away. Um, here is the black woodpecker. It's also um, quite loud species that was detected up to 315 meters. Um, and here is golden areola. Some species, they, they <laughs> had like this very 
rapid drop in detectability. And this is because they had like a very, very straight cut uh, on certain distances. Like they never were there. So that's the reason for, for those straight lines, almost straight lines here. So if we go back to that um, general probability of detection uh, for those two transects, we can divide it into, for example, season. So you can see April, May, and June for each species group. And you can see that sometimes the difference between two transect types was more prominent. For example, here, um, the deciduous forest had lower detectability, um, but you can see that, uh, for example, in the medium group, those differences, they were very stable. And please remember that we did not have many repetitions because each time we played the experiment, something in the setup was changed and it usually was the height of the speaker. So these things that I'm showing now, they are very specific to our setup. And if you look into some other works that investigate uh, different factors influencing uh, sound propagation, uh, it's very probable that you will see quite different conclusions that they have in their works. So in this case, we had the most detections in May and it was the most stable month if we consider the differences between uh, transit types. Here we, we can also divide the probability of detection uh, between different heights. So the situation is very similar to what we had previously. So medium group, again, is very stable if we, if we compare two transects and there are more prominent differences uh, in larger and uh, small group. Um, but you know, this is something that was specific to our setup. And in this case, the least detections were stated at nine meters height. So how to plan PAM research having this information? So we came up with PAM formula that would um, allow to calculate the minimum distance between recorders. So um, I know th those figures, they look like googly eyes, I can't help it, but when I see them, they always do uh, to me like googly eyes. So um, they follow very simple formula where you have only three variables. So small t is the home range radius. So this is that big circle for species with big home ranges and that small one for species with smaller home ranges. Small b is detection range radi radius. So the thing that we were investigating in this work. So that's the center because here we are assuming that the certain that the center of this colored cir circle is uh, the recorder. And capital D is the distance between re recorders. So here and here should be uh, the recorders. So this formula is uh, basically for species that have loud, uh, larger home, home ranges or territories than they can be heard. And that usually is for uh, big species, for example, uh, pigeons. And the other one is for species that live in larger densities. So they can have smaller territories, but their vocalizations, they are quite loud. So they can still be heard at the edges of their neighbor um, territories. So here is the example for the song thrush. So if we consider um, territory to be territory radius to be 50 meters. And from our work, um, we have we know that the distance uh, for the song thrush with 90% detectability was 150 meters. Then we know that the territory radius is smaller than the detection radius. So we get this formula and we can triple the detection radius. Uh, so we have... Uh, three multiplied with 150, and it gives us 450 meters to be the distance between two recorders to ensure that those birds that are recorded, uh, they are different individuals. 
And of course, birds can sing from the corners of the territory. So here, or I don't know, here. And in most, case, most cases, we don't really know where the center is. So when we go to the field, uh, it's very random. But this setup should ensure that we are recording different individuals on our device. So this is the table that we have included in our paper. You have all those 31 species. Um, there is this uh, certain probability value that you can choose. So if you want 90% detectability for the song crush, you have that 150 meters. And here we have territory ready for deciduous and coniferous forests. And they were taken from, our, uh, for, from the work of our colleagues uh, that were doing this in Białowieża primeval forest over several years. So sometimes the ranges can be quite high and you have to choose something that is uh, more close to your setup. Uh, but you know, we have to start somewhere. <laughs> so uh, as a basic, this is, this is a really good, uh, it should be a really good guide for you to, uh, to use in the field. Okay, so this work is already out. Um, it's open access, so you can see it. It's in scientific reports. We have done this with um, both of my supervisors, so uh, you can check that. And one thing that I did not mention is that during the analysis, um, we have noticed that sometimes we are detecting the species by ear, even though it is not visible on the spectrogram. And it's not because of masking, although sometimes it is. Uh, so there is uh, there is the difference between um, visibility on the spectrogram, which is this solid line for each species, and audibility in the recording, which is this dashed line. So sometimes you have species <laughs> that do not show any difference. So this is the Eurasian tree creeper. And this is actually that species that had this very rapid drop in one of the figures. And sometimes you have very big difference like in the case of the common chaffinch, uh, <laughs> where um, it wasn't, because these are the mean distances. So it wasn't visible um, at, at further distances because there were many chaffinches there, there were lots of masking. And actually in this case, uh, it was super difficult, but uh, in general, the difference uh, is not that big, but it's there. So, we wanted to investigate that a little bit more, and that leads us to part two, which is data processing um, and detection distances, yes. So this work is currently under review, so have in mind that things might change a little bit. But for this, we have to go back to the general detectability. So it consists of two terms, so availability, which is simply the fact that the bird is singing and it is available for us to detect, it can be heard, but also the perceptibility, oh, sorry, perceptibility, uh, which is the fact that the observer is able to hear that singing species and can identify. So in PAM, this concept is sort of simplified because we can assume that since we are recording species, they are all available on the recording for us to detect them. And with detection in PAM, uh, as I said previously, we can listen to the recordings, we can view the spectrograms, but we can also check detections um, that were done by automated software that is detecting the species for us. So once again, the transmission experiment is exactly the same. The setup is just the same as I showed previously, but what I didn't say, is that at night, one hour after uh, sunset, we were playing 12 nocturnal species. Uh, no, nocturnal, but also there were species with, uh, with diurnal habits. Uh, and there was also a niger. Um, and some species were not necessarily inhabiting forests. But in Poland, we have those 12 uh, species from, from this order. And we wanted to include all of them. Uh, just to have more diverse vocal characteristics that was that would tell us more about uh, sound propagation when you have those 
uh, vocal characteristics uh, like that. So just uh, the disclaimer that uh, that it it was not uh, very logical, but uh, we have reasoning behind it. Uh, yeah, and all of the things are the same, so it was also one minute. We also had groups, so small, medium, and large owl species, and we also tried to, to match their natural loudness. For the analysis, we used everything as it was, so eyes and ears, but also for the automated analysis, we used BirdNet 2.2, uh, that was incorporated in Raven Pro, and here we chose a 0 0.1 threshold, so uh, quite quite a low value, and one second overlap. And that was chosen uh, to give BirdNet uh, a fair chance because um, a fair chance to detect species, because we only had that one minute sample, so we thought that would be uh, quite a short time for for the software to show its uh, possibilities. If someone doesn't know how BirdNet works, uh, here is just a quick reminder. So BirdNet takes spectrogram and divides it into three second spectrograms. So if you have interval, it basically takes that fragment that is cut uh, in the overlap. Uh, so when it takes the spectrograms, it compares it to its trained database and based on that, it gives you species with certain probabilities uh, and certain scores. So the scores are from mm, that 0 0.1 threshold that we set to one, uh, and the closer to zero, the less certain the detection is. Um, here are the models. So the setup is very much the same, but this time we included interactions between terms uh, to see how they affect whether the species is detected or not. So here again, only the significant results. So you can see that there were least uh, detections with automated method. Uh, the further away uh, the least detections there were, more detections were stated at night and more detections were stated for uh, bigger species, larger species. And if we consider what affected maximum scores that BirdNet uh, assigned to each detection, we can see that higher scores were achieved at night, uh, which makes perfect sense because owls are quite loud. Um, and also um, lower scores were, uh, were assigned when the distance was further away and when the playback was played for higher uh, height. Here you can see the detection probability for each species group. So you can see that for each group, it was always the same. So listening provided the best results. So the highest detection probability was uh, when we were listening to the recordings. Uh, a little bit lower was when we were viewing the spectrograms, but the difference is very small. Uh, it's kind of reminds me the difference between those two transects in the general detectability uh, figure. And here is BirdNet, and you can see that in each group, it was a little bit worse than those manual methods. Um, also, I need to say that this value of zero is uh, counted for playback recording, because we, we also introduced that playback to see how BirdNet would, uh, would go with it. And if you thought that the distance of 500 meters would be too short for the owls, then yes, for manual analysis, OK, I agree. But for BirdNet, it was perfect because we uh, we got to that uh, almost zero, um, almost zero uh, detectability. Here are the mean scores, uh, mean BirdNet scores for species in each group. So you can see that. Nocturnal small species, they were they were crushing it. Uh, Bernet was super good with detecting those species. Also nocturnal medium groups, so um, long-eared owl, a tawny owl, uh, it was very good with, with those species. Also diurnal large, large species well, were detected very well. Um, I was quite surprised that uh, it wasn't that good with uh, large species, nocturnal large species, so eagle owl, great gray owl, and also Ural Owl. 
Uh, but what surprised me the most is that on the playback recording, it, it didn't do so well uh, in two species. So those two dots here, uh, that dot below is the long tail tip, and the other one is the red crossbow. So what we think is that Burnett wasn't super good with those species because they have their song is like basically those unstructured chirps. So maybe it was difficult for Burnett to detect them, but this is more of a question to to the developers. And also what I said was that um, Burnett scores, they are very species specific and also recording specific. So maybe uh, something wasn't that great here. Uh, so you can see how different species um, came out. Uh, so here is that long tail tit, so you can only see that uh, playback recording. But for most species, it did quite well. Um, for most small species, you have at least three distances, uh, or two distances, sorry. Um, so up to 100 meters, where Burnett still could detect them quite well. Um, the greatest star was, of course, uh, Eurasian tree creeper. It was super well visible uh, on the spectrogram, so 150 meters. Um, here is something that was quite weird. So a black woodpecker, where you have uh, the distance of 200 and 250 meters, and uh, the score at 200 is very low. And score at 250 meters is uh, quite high. And I must say that in these two distances, the black woodpecker was super well visible. So I don't know what uh, what was going on here, uh, but that was quite surprising to us and we don't know why this happened. Uh, but yeah, other than that, you can see that uh, Burnett did pretty well with most of the species. All right, so uh, here's a bonus. So the top scoring species in Burnett, of course, was Little Owl. If you know those devilish calls, then you know that they they are super well hearable, they can propagate well, and Burnett was really good with um, detecting them. So because of what I said, we think that detection methods should also be considered when we discuss detectability and pump planning because they will affect the conclusions that we draw uh, that we draw from our data and, and uh, how we formulate our uh, conclusions. And yeah, so which method is the most effective? Which one is the winner? Um, you saw that listening provided the best results, but I think that the true effectiveness of Burnett lies in the time of the analysis. So you can uh, you can analyze a very small amount of material when you are using your own senses. Uh, and with Burnett, you can analyze tons of hours of recordings. So this is something to really think of. Um, when you are when you are doing your analysis. Uh, so yeah, the take home message: choosing the best method is a trade off between effectiveness and precision, because as I said, you can analyze, for example, ten minutes manually, and you will have super thorough uh, analysis of your recording, and you can analyze ten hours of recordings with with Burnett, and you have you will have less precision but more material. So um, it's something to, to think of when you are deciding which, which method is the best for you. So um, yeah, this is something to consider, which method is the best for you and your research. Uh, this is something very specific to your study, your setup. Um, and if you are doing your studies, think of your detection range to make your studies more um, reproducible and comparable with uh, others people work. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's it. I'd like to thank you for listening to me. And I also would like to thank uh, Tomasz Osiejuk and Paweł Szymański, my supervisors, who were all co-authors of this work. And I wouldn't have done this uh, without them. Yeah, that's it. Bravo, Dominica. Thank you so much you. for the presentation.